Good evening. Uh, today we have here Forest Matter, a selection of a video, a video creation celebrating trees' poetic power. In this fourth edition, four of the eight works presented have been specially produced, and so is the case of Tala, the work we have seen today in a video format and which has been premiered live just a fortnight ago in RCR La Villa with the assistance of the participants of the RCR Summer Workshop, Rafael, Carmen, Ramon, and some special guests. This work reflects how a plant is uh, alive as long as its roots are, and that it is not uncommon for felled trees to sprout new shoots and come back to life. The Argentinian dancer, Luciana Groato, graduated in 2019 with a master in performing arts and visual culture at the Museo, Museo Reina Sofia and the University of Castilla-La Mancha. In addition, she was trained at the Teatro Colón Higher Dance Institute in Buenos Aires, Argentina, at the Bordeaux Higher Dance Institute in France, and the Rudra Bejar School in Lausanne, Switzerland with Maurice Béjar, Heidi, Plisetsky, Gascar, Exen, Bayard, Woodworth, Chase, as the most recognized teachers. Currently, she is part of the Artistas Inflammables Collective, an experimental physical dance and theater company. This work precedes Sri Lankan architect Palinda Kanangada's lecture on the beauty of doing less. Sri Lanka, known for centuries as Ceylon, has a vis history spreading over 2,500 years. Primarily being a Buddhist nation, it has developed culturally and architecturally rooted in the practices of Theravada Buddhism. The way of living has been influenced by the Buddhist practice of Shunyata, which translates to voidness or silence and its approach to design encourages a reductive philosophy. Palinda Kanangara has a mathematic and architecture background. As a student, Palinda trained with Sri Lankan modernist architect Anura Rantabibushtana, who has worked with renowned Sri Lankan architect Geoffrey Bawa for 16 years. Palinda established an independent practice in 2005. Palinda Kanangara Architects is known for experiential architecture that hinges on simplicity and connection with the natural environment. The firm's work has been recognized for its contextual sensitivity, handcrafted use of materials and minimalism, reflective of Sri Lankan ethos on diverse palette of projects, often in small scale. The firm has received several prestigious national and international awards in his uh, 16 years of practice. The studio's Rajagiriya headquarters was awarded the Reba International Awards for Excellence in Architecture in 2018. More recently, they have won the Reba International Award for Excellence for their artist retreat at Pitugala and the 15th and the fifth triennial Geoffrey Bauer Award for Excellence in Architecture for the project Frame Holiday Structure in Imadua in 2021. The firm's work has been featured by El Croquis in a recent monograph 2000, uh, 212. We will now hear some words from Gim Costa, Vice Dean of the Architects Association of Catalonia, an organization with a history dating back more than 80 years with national and international prestige. Since 2020, the Architects Association of Catalonia co-organizes with RCR Bunker Foundation the Open Program, having in common the mission to uphold the social value of architecture and town and country planning on behalf of society and architects. The, Arch the Architects Association of uh, Catalonia is part of the Board of Trustees of the RCA Bunga Foundation. Gim Costa graduated from the School of Architecture of Barcelona and has his studio where he develops architecture, urban planning, planning and furniture design projects through his firm Gitlöf Originals. 
In parallel and throughout his career, he has collaborated in publications as Quadrens Arquitectura y Urbanismo and with the editorial house uh, Gustavo Gili. In addition to participating in the governing bodies of the Architects Association of uh, Catalonia, Costa is member of the Executive Committee, uh, Committee of the Manuel Blancafort Foundation and a trustee of the Ginesta Foundation. Now I pass the word to Kim Gosta. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Uh, I will do my conference in, in English, so uh, people that are not from here can understand my words. I'm, well, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, I feel privileged to be here this evening with all of you and in such a wonderful space uh, for such a nice meeting. Uh, La Garrocha is, with no doubt, an incomparable geographical space. Where else can we find a beach forest sprouting over a volcanic eruption or the crater of a volcano integrated into the landscape of the town that has grown up around it? A city, Olot, which tonight brings us together and is a desirable cultural, historical, and strategic focus. I want to congratulate uh, RCR, Aranda Pijen Vilalta, the organizers since 2012 of this now traditional program for the sensitivity and the delicacy in the choice of the venue for this 2022 edition of the summer workshop. Congratulations also on your choice for this special edition in which we physically meet again in such a magical setting after almost three years of exceptionality due to the health crisis resulting from the COVID. The activities on this working day's focus on understanding architecture and landscape from a transversal and open perspective. Thus, the summer workshop is a welcoming space where different creative disciplines, which go far beyond architecture, give us different perspectives on the conceptualization of space, precisely to achieve, to achieve sorry, this interdisciplinary vision that makes us grow. Therefore, the Transversal Conversations series of the open program that brings us all together right now is perhaps the maximum expression of this transversality. Architecture professionals, professionals from other disciplines, amateurs, and all citizens in general come together to chat and enjoy learning to look at our environment differently. The workshop is a door, a connection, a relationship with other ways of doing architecture, the world of culture, dance, scenography, and photography. The workshop connects architecture with the world of art and culture. And we cannot forget that this interconnection also implies that the workshop is a meeting point with other cultures, perhaps not so well known or close to our daily reality. Now we have at this moment and in this context, the good fortune to talk with an architect from Sri Lanka, Balinda Kanangara, whom I was not lucky enough to know personally, but whom I have admired from a long time. I wanted to say a personal word that I was in Sri Lanka four years ago, five years ago, uh, to know the Georg, uh, Jeffrey Baba architecture and I got to uh, know uh, his architecture directly. And it's true that he has marked a way to do architecture in Sri Lanka, and I think Balinda is a, one of the best examples of this way of doing. Balinda Kanagara, with his work, represent two essential points of connection, with tropical architecture and with the architectural culture of his country. His work is a direct legacy of that of Geoffrey Baba, the most representative architect of his country. Balinda was trained by what we could say to be Baba's discipline, Anura Pradnavish Shuana. Tropical architecture has much to teach us in these times of climatic emergency. It is frankly open, exposed to the elements, 
and it has no distinct insides and outside. And the best way to take care of the environment is to be part of the environment. To be a part of it, to be aware of it, this is what Palinda Kanagara's architecture proposes. And it is precisely this synergy with the landscape, with nature, with the environment that is found in all his work that is poetic. The exterior, interior spaces merge into each other, embrace each other. The relationship with the vegetation, with the water, with the breeze that cross it. In short, the union with the elements. This is what, is, what, this is what we should uh, think about now, all of the architects from my point of view. I could go on, but I don't want to take time away from our special guest. And I leave you with Palinda Cannagara, who undoubtedly has things to tell us and powerful work to show us. Let's enjoy it. Palinda, the floor is yours. Ayupawan. It's great honor to be invited to be part of the 15th annual RCR program and share our work today with you. Uh, my sincere thanks and gratitude to architect Carmen, Raphael, and Roman for your kind invitation and hospitality. Thanks to Andrea from RCR to organize this. And my Gratitude to Fernando Marcus from El Croquis for recognizing the works of our small practice, doing small scale works. And I would like to thank uh, architecture founder of Catalonia again uh, to inviting. Um, I am Palinda Khanagara, an architect from Sri Lanka. So um, the theme of workshop of beauty is certainly appropriate of these times. Beauty has been, um, has been ignored as an inessential, overlooked through most of the last century. Considered not worthy of critical disclosure, especially in the Western architecture world. The beauty, pleasure, detachment, all associated has continued to remain important to us in Sri Lanka, um, the mostly as a philosophical manifestation of Buddhism. Therefore, critical to our approach to design. So I want to, to give you a little bit of a background or a, to give a little bit of a, a brief introduction to where I'm practicing. So it might uh, give you a better understanding the scale of our work and relate to the context. Um, the Sri Lanka is a jewel in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the vast history spread in over 2,500 years. A small island of 64,000 kilo, square kilometers with a population of 22 million. Um, displaying a remarkable diversity within the small area, varied in topography, um, to the lower lowland hills, central mountain range, and plateau. It's starting from the coastal plain. As it, an, as it is an island, isolated means endemism, therefore rich biodiversity, flora and fauna has existed. Sri Lanka, primarily being a Buddhist nation, it has developed culturally and architecturally rooted in the practice of Theravada Buddhism. The Buddhism arrived in Sri Lanka from India in 3rd century BC with the tenant of Ahimsa that ends to the formation of strong environmental ethos in the country, which has influenced planning, spatial design and aesthetics and continue to influence our practice. The way of living has been influenced by the Buddhist practice of Shunyata, which translates to wideness, or the silence and its approach to design, encouraging a 
reduction philosophy, reductive philosophy. So minimalism is a way that is embedded with the Buddhism. The Buddhism idea of emptiness or nothingness, shunyata, in its many historical manifestations. The country is divided predominantly into two climate zones uh, based on the monsoon, its wetland, wet zone, and the dry zone. Um, historically, an ecological mandate was established in Sri Lanka, which was the ancient kings were considered as the custodians of the natural resources. That leads to develop a visionary approach to environmental planning that includes the conservation of soil, water, and biodiversity. Uh, the kings built elaborate irrigation system comprising of network of tanks to harvest, the harvest and manage the water in the dry zone. Our works in deeply inspired by the philosophy of reduction or moving towards a state of emptiness. We would like to share examples of ancient Sri Lankan architecture and landscape that embodied this inspiration and continue to inspire us in our practice. So I'm gonna start a few of the examples that it's, I inspired and we thought we might share some of these things to get uh, the understanding about historical architectural example that gives you a, a better idea about uh, the Sri Lankan uh, architecture in the past. So this is actually plan of the uh, Kaludya Pokuna that is called in Singhala, the Kaludya Pokuna means the black water pond. It's a part of the monastery. It's a very interesting, uh, uh, the tank. It's a water is almost like a black because it's a base on the rock. And it's actually a reservoir for uh, the Mihintale complex. It's a part of the main complex of monks residence. So this is actually a bathing uh, area as well as a meditation part of that. And it's a good example how this architecture pathway continues and gives a little bit of journey and gives a little bit of mood when the, through the steps, how you can approach to the uh, higher positions. So the temples always built at the higher point and the journey is very important and uh, it's a winding through the landscape and always there's a, a dialogue between the man-made and the nature. So we're trying to respect the nature always and we don't want to be destroyed and it has to be a part of it. So the ancient architecture always trying to have a dialogue between the land, sky, and the water. So when you go through this, the winding steps, you end up with these, the pavilions that is also part of the natural environment. So it's, it's trying to merge with the natural element and without destroying. So it's, that's how we're trying to merge with the elements and be a part of it. So uh, this is the Kaludya Pokuna. It's actually, you can see the lines, the geometrical lines, where it, how it meets the natural element. So it gives you how the architect landscape can be made in the natural context and uh, without uh, destroying the natural uh, lines. And again, I'm trying to show another monastery. This is a Aran Kale monastery. It's a fifth century monastery. It's almost like a walking meditation pathway. In this, again, uh, the journey is very important. It consists of tanks, kutis for the monks for meditation. So the, the pathway is a part of the meditation. So it's a monastery is based on the walking meditation. So that gives you, again, the how this architecture can be harmony with the landscape and uh, how we can respect to the nature, again, the, the pathway gives the journey uh, continue. And uh, with the elements, with the steps, and use the levels, and uh, created the tanks that you can, for the water need, but then again, enjoy the, the elements, the forest. And this is a part of it is as a kuti, that's going to be merged with the, uh, the rock, and it's beautiful light quality comes through that light, that the small openings, 
and uh, the material we stand ta been taking use from the available material. So these are the small example. And again, uh, you can see the, the architecture is almost like only for the re need, very small. Footprint is very small. We are trying to be enjoy outside or living with the nature more than trying to build access uh, like a big rooms. So uh, this is a Ritigala Nada Monastery. Uh, this is also forest monastery, and it consists again with the water for the monk. And then this is actually a very special monk devoted to extreme austerity, a search for enlightenment. And um, you can see the path, how the journey, and continues again with these man-made tanks, and the journey giving winding pathways to respect and save trees and the rocks and boulders. And again, this is a part of the meditation, the circular platforms. And uh, these are really inspired or uh, to trying to enjoy as a ancient architecture. So this is another good example how the landscape uh, can take us through some pathways. And this is actually uh, the, the Sigiriya. It's a fifth century royal complex. It's a citadel uh, surrounded by water, boulder, terrace, and pleasure garden. Um, so it's importantly, it has a very much hidden water management system in the dry zone. So it's uh, surrounded by the moat, and uh, going through these uh, symmetrical uh, the landscape uh, to the boulder gardens. And then the boulder garden, this is a Sigiriya, uh, the rock and the palace on top with the ponds. But especially, I would like to show you the journey to that, the, the, the citadel or the, uh, the top of the mountain where his palace was located. He built some ponds and some uh, structures on top of it. But most importantly, the journey through the landscapes takes you to the boulders and different changing the landscape style from the symmetrical landscape to the boulder landscape through the rocks. And then again, taken with the available material like brick and the stones uh, and the hidden pathways and end up with some of open areas. And finally, you end up with the, uh, the the top of the Mount Rock. So um, I would like to give a little bit of a background to our practice um, because we are trying to uh, work with a very small scale project and we started in 2005. Um, we were trying to work with the mostly, um, you know, close to the site. So our architecture essentially focuses on capturing and expressing the spirit and magic of the place, whether it's a marsh or a cliff or an urban scape. The site is a generator of our old ideas, the core to our design process. So we've tried to start with the initial sketch uh, from the site, and then from that we develop in the series of sketches and work, work in models, different, different models, and we still do that model within these years. And um, we don't want to freeze the design. We always keep a flexibility to develop on site. Because since that we have a small practice, we always closely work on site and we work with the contractors close, closely and we have been collected or uh, work with the similar contractors throughout this, specialized, for example, carpenters for the same projects continues through from the start to the end now. Um, so likewise, we were trying to train people under our details and they were just only working for our, with our work. So. Uh, Basically, this was uh, 2008. We were started with a very small uh, group of people in a small annex. And then we, in 2015, we moved into this office. And uh, now we are continue practicing in this. And you can see the models, how we were trying to work and develop, and with the series of models to develop the architecture from the initial concept design to the final, and even with the final design, with any changes, we want to make more and more models. So we believe in trying to have a more like a flexibility by making the physical models has a more chance of developing it rather than uh, doing a presentation. But we believe in, I mean, we have to do it with the current requirement, but we always make models for ourselves to develop. 
So this is our team working closely in a one room. I will explain this uh, studio later on with my project. So I would like to start with this project. I thought it's going to be a, a good example from the, uh, the start. So this is uh, located in Habarana, close to Sigiriya and Habarana Monastery that I was explained. Um, so this is a 4.5 acre land. So when I visit the site, it's almost like a very much flat ground. The land condition was like this at that time. So the program or the requirement of the client is to have the 10 room villa or the resort there. So he wanted to make a, like a re uh, retreat that is for the uh, the restoration of the mind and body and the soul. So we were trying to, inspired from the regional architecture and the material that is available, uh, we actually, we were, when we studied the land, we realized that um, uh, next to the, uh, the land, there was a water canal. And actually, so next to big reservoir or the tank, but we couldn't see the from the land. So we trying to keep the building and the landscape to develop within the site. So understanding the, uh, the water at that number 10, that is a small uh, canal, uh, during the monsoon, it start getting overflowing to the ground. So we have advised to raise the ground by one and a half feet, but it was not a good idea because we were trying to create, we are trying to raise the ground. So we are creating more and more impact to the overflowing area. So what we have done is we've only wanted to raise the pathway and then the villas that you can enjoy from there, the surrounding. So that was the idea of the, uh, the, the initial idea. So the pathway that we were trying to do is actually almost like a winding pathway, like a meditation pathway that is to save a lot of trees and to make it like a journey where you can start from the, from the parking and then you take through these areas to give you a ultimately you end up with the circular meditation path. In between, you will find the villas and the reception and uh, as well as the other facilities. So this is the long section from the road at the end that side and the tank, uh, the Habarna tank is this side, but we can't see it because of the bun that is uh, more than 20 feet high from the ground. So. This is the context that you can see. We were trying to, uh, the scale, reduce the height below the canopy level. So then the building is almost disappeared from the distance. Um, and uh, we were trying to locate the buildings where the big trees are not uh, damaged. So this is the main road and you can see the, uh, the Habarana tank and then the, beyond that the mountains are the Sigiriya. Uh, so that you can see from a, on, from the bun. Um, so this is the layout. Even the building has taken the shape of the uh, pathways and trying to save trees and the form is derived from these available condition. Um, so this is the bridge across that uh, water canal. So we use the available timber leftovers from the window frame to clad the steel structure and um, it's a journey starting again from the parking to the, uh, the pathway. So uh, you can see this is the entrance and as you go on, you start seeing the winding pathways. And another good thing of, by racing this uh, pathway, you have uh, eye level taken to the higher level and you see vast area of the landscape and that gives you more uh, connect with the landscape, not at the ground level. And the second thing is, we were trying to save the natural landscape much as possible and not to introduce any landscape because it's already beautiful. So in that, there are so creep, you know, creatures are living, like snakes can be there. So we wanted to safeguard the guests who are coming. So we want to clean this area, uh, both sides of the pathway, so then you know exactly if there's anything uh, crawling onto this area. So that makes us more uh, practical. And uh, by the time it start getting the moss and trying to make it a drama with the brick. So this is another character of the brick because it's aged very quickly with the monsoons and start getting, gives you a color to the architecture. And these, as you go on with the pathway, so initially as you go to the first and you get the twin villas. 
we were trying to minimize the footprint by having a two-story structures. So it gives you uh, eight rooms at the entrance that overlooking the farmlands. And that's the uh, geometrical entrance. So actually, we were trying to give a demarcation of the curvier pathways and then a defined pathway to the villas by having a straight lines. So as you go on, you will end up with the, um, the staircase to the upper level, and you have a two paths to take it to the two rooms. And, um, and that's how we were trying to separate the two villas with the landscape of introducing trees. And that's from the paddy fields, how it looks. Uh, so it's almost like, um, you know, shuts out from the columns. And um, we were trying to use the timber to make it more connect with the landscape. And um, we were wanted to make it the interior also much as possible to relate to the exterior. So we were not to introduce anything um, different from the exterior. So this is a bedroom interior. And uh, even the, the toilet, we want to get a cross ventilation and with the courtyards and same material we use for the, uh, as a, uh, elements. And then from there, you can see the next uh, villas are the single story villa, where you get the same architectural language, but it's in a single story format. And I'm trying to create a, uh, almost like floating above that area. So we introduce uh, uh, the water at the base. So this is the entrance to the twin villa, or the single story villa. And uh, in a rainy season, the water collects at the lower part, and it becomes a pond. In a dry season, it becomes a landscape. So uh, that's how it is, floats above the water, and uh, very light material. So visually also, we want to make it almost like a floating, and the material we carefully selected, not to make it heavy, and very thin lines. Uh, it gives you a little bit of almost floats above it. But the enjoyment from the inside to outside is almost, when you are inside the room, is almost, the connection is very strong. We want to enjoy the landscape, the grasses, and that's the create, what we want to create within the villas. So um, the journey goes again with the winding paths. You can see the same, uh, the building, that, that is a reception. You can see at the, this corner, and that is the, the restaurant. We were trying to create a water, the, the rainwater harvesting ponds that it can be more like a magical or gives a more reflections to the building. Um, so this is a form of the reception and it's almost like a pavilion that's nothing there. Uh, only the brick structures are the, for the washrooms and the office building. Uh, the build, the fl roof floats over that, uh, the boxes. And um, you can see the volume that I'm trying to get with the cross ventilation and a big eaves again, for the monsoon to prevent inside. And if you see the uh, colonnade or uh, uh, the columns that are placed, is almost outside of the inner line. So the inner line is like more protected with the eaves. Uh, the water won't come into the, uh, the, the stone area. So that much of monsoon rain comes in sometimes in this area. And, um, and this is a restaurant block that uh, again, we were extending the, the roof, again, one grid beyond the building line, just to prevent the water get into the building. Um, so the same continual, same, that water links the two buildings, the public building, and uh, the handrail details, we created like a seating that you can sit and enjoy uh, and have a meal at the edge of the building. And um, so in the night, it looks like a, you know, lanterns on the, in the water. So it's, we were trying to get a reflection from the water and that's how it looks in the night. So uh, it's, we, what, that's what we want to create, like a floating lantern in the water. Um, so basically, so this is the, um, actually after that it goes, end up with the uh, circular pathways that we were trying to create like a, a uh, space that you can have uh, like meditation circular pathways, but it's almost like a space that they can have uh, 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 special nights, some events, 
So that is finally we were trying to have it, but it's almost among the tree canopies. So that is what they are doing at the moment with this space. So this project, I'm trying to um, give you, and again, um, another thing that I want to emphasize with this project is actually a very low budget uh, project that we were trying to work with the client very closely. We select the project not based on the budget because in the Sri Lankan, uh, we don't have that much of an open project for the project. So we, we need to find methods how we can control the budget, how we can work with the client, and how we can closely work and we find some of the material and we have a dialogue with the client before we start the designing. Um, so this one actually situated in a uh, particular close to Colombo, maybe like uh, the capital if you have to go one hour drive. So this is for an artist. So he came to us with this, you know, this is what he was doing. So it's a very young couple. So he has purchased a very sloping land without any trees or anything uh, next to the highway. So he has a very limited budget. He was not sure whether he can get design from me. So you can see the slopes and the condition of the initial site. Um, so when it, uh, when we, after we discuss, we realize that we have to do something very open because this house is not only as a residence, so it's a gallery uh, as, and then a workshop for himself to paint a big painting. So, um, we, what we were trying to do, we were trying to enclose the uh, surrounding or the uh, perimeter with the perforated walls, trying to get uh, airflow through the building and want to create a very open building within that. So this is uh, the ground floor plan. It's almost like a garden pavilion. So we were trying to connect a lot of series of garden. Visually, I want to link, and at the same time, I want to have the uh, levels to be used and uh, that's elements that I'm trying to use with the like steps, like a monument, uh, like a monastery. So uh, if you can see this, it's a totally open plan. And uh, upper floor, we were trying to give him a more private, more secured space for his family. Um, so this is a section of the building. By having this topography or the slopes, we were trying to manage the upper level with the same level by creating a different volume at the upper level and the lower level. And by use, doing that, we managed to get a 14 feet for the, uh, the studio that he can have a bigger volume for his commissions. So he can paint in that area next to the pantry. So it's again uh, connect with the living area visually. So that's uh, one of the another section through the living space. And uh, this is how we started. We were trying to have a perforated wall just to wrap around, just to give us security and as well as the barrier of the sound uh, from the highway. So that create a buffer to the ground, uh, to the house. And this is from the paddy field uh, from the highway side. And that's from the uh, other road. And we were basically wanted to have an envelope uh, that create uh, privacy and as you open you start going into the building and it's almost like a very straight line fin walls and create define the spaces and there's no any other elements so the landscape is very important Varna did the landscape my partner so we were she was trying to use the only the plants that is available from the surrounding and that makes it more connection to the inside outside even a uh, inner garden, almost connect with the outer garden. Um, and also we were trying to work with this very selectively with the furniture. We were trying to reuse some of the antique furnitures, uh, not purposely used actually. This is a, what you're seeing is a printing press a trace that we combined as a um, uh, coffee table. Um, and some of the benches we use as a sofas. And we left everything open. That gives you more visual connection to the lower level. And um, some areas you connect with the garden. And again, the pantry also part of the studio. And this is what I was meant. Um, so you have uh, steps that is actually spill over. And uh, you connect the visually the living and the dining. And that helps you to have more gathering or a spillover space for the dining or the living space. 
that's his workshop at the end of the, um, the dining. And when it comes to the upper level, we were trying to work with the different material or a plaster that it gives a more smoother and a change of mood. Uh, so this is a family area. So it's more like a refine or a smoother surface for the bedrooms and more lockable spaces. And this is the master bedroom. And you can see even we were trying to create a water garden at the uh, rooftop level and it always connect with the lower part and want to do reconnect with these lower and the upper with the landscape. So even the material, we were trying to work with the available material. There was no specific wood that we want to specify. So it makes us more budget, uh, you know, flexibility and control the budget by having any kind of wood with the different pattern. But actually, end of the day, it becomes an art or a, you know, good contribution to the um, design. So this is a, another project that I thought of a similar line of uh, thinking or a material. So this is more urban building. Uh, this house is in uh, uh, Mount Lavinia. It's more close, more residential area. You can see the dense of these, uh, the surrounding and more urban building, but still there's nothing that we can inspire or, uh, you know, get a view from the site. So this is a condition of the first day or a groundbreaking day. Um, what we were trying to do, actually, this family is a, uh, the, the business person. Uh, they are actually young family. They are, but the roots are from the, in India. So they have a, uh, they are actually Hindu uh, couple. So they had the background of South Indian uh, uh, flavor and they, want, they are very familiar with these towns of South Indian. So we were trying to work with the different town housing that we were trying to work with the courtyard, how we can have it with the a bigger area, small area. So we were trying to find a different courtyards that we can work with the solids and voids and a garden and an inner space. So finally, we were trying to work with the side shapes and end up with that kind of a courtyard. So then again, we were trying to use the brick as an element that it's a decorative element that can bind the spaces. So this wraps the entire building as a ribbon from exterior to the interior. So that's the uh, concept that we want to have it. And we nicely, we se separate the function of the services and create the courtyard in the middle. And uh, the, as you enter, you can see the series of courtyard and that makes you visually bigger space uh, for the uh, user. So the basic, typically we want to make the upper floor as a private spaces for the family. So that's what we have done uh, with the uh, more enclosed areas, but still we want to have a visual connection to the living space. So uh, this is the one section through the uh, uh, living, but if you can notice that there's a walkway above the number eight. Number is actually the, uh, the shrine room. I want to create a, a longer shrine with a darker space, and that smells comes from these opening at the living space, and that gives a beautiful uh, fragrance uh, to the living space through that opening. So that section, I might have it. So this is a facade. Uh, we were trying to work with almost like a enclosed facade with the brick and then blank with the timber opening. And uh, that's how it is looks. And we use the reclaim uh, stones always uh, from the T estate. These were actually removed from the, some of the roads uh, in Sri Lanka. So we were really fascinated of you reusing the material and what is available. And um, from outside, you can't see what is happening beyond the, uh, the door. So as you come, that wall continues to the interior. So it will be part of the interior as well as the exterior. So as I mentioned, that those are the opening from the shrine room that gives you uh, the smell or the fragrance from the, the puja room. And above that is uh, the walkway of the staircase. So this is the connection to the inside, to the outside. 
and uh, you can see the elements that we were trying to use from what is inside, uh, also a part of the exterior walls. And the same uh, stone paving from outside we have taken into the uh, center courtyard. And uh, it, the landscape continued to the rear garden as well. So this is the staircase walkway or the landing. So underneath that is a shrine room. And uh, upper level has a visual link to the lower part of the uh, area building. That's where the living room is. And um, this is the master bedroom. We were trying to work with the timber shutters that we can control the uh, views because it's uh, being situated in an urban uh, step setup. We have to control the views. So whenever we want to, we can shut the entire uh, the window, but still the light comes from the top. Uh, that gives enough uh, light to the bedroom. That's the uh, gr ground level bedroom detail. At the end of the pavers, we are trying to get a water. Whenever we want to have a rainy season, we can fill that corner. But again, you can remove the water that becomes a part of the paved uh, landscape. So uh, we thought of, we are trying to show some of more example from the ancient architecture. So this is another interesting uh, building. It's called Tampita Vihara. Tampita means a building on pillars. So this was happened after 13th century to 19th century. So this is actually image house or uh, the building or a uh, shelter for a stupa or a image, uh, the statue for the Buddha. So it has a veranda right around. And it, uh, the idea is to detach the building lift from the ground to prevent the timber damp from the ground or uh, detach from these uh, termite uh, attack. So it's a very nice uh, idea how to build, lift the building and how you can use the technology to understand the material to uh, support, reinforce them. So that's some of the old uh, Tampita Vihara section. And these are still available, and because has, it's still out of timber, but still it's, because it's on a stone pillars, it's saved uh, uh, to the last, to, the, up to now. And, uh, and some Tampita Vihara, you can see some walls on the, even on the timber beams. And I thought it's a very nice, or uh, gives a better idea about different style of architecture in Sri Lanka. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, structure. This is called Ambalama. It's actually a resting place. So ma mainly they, these are built and maintained by the villagers. This is actually a rest for the travelers. Uh, this is uh, uh, for the travelers. They can meet here. They can have their meals. They can rest. It's a beautiful concept. It's like uh, uh, the timber beams. And then it's lifted again from the ground with the boulders uh, to uh, avoid the dampness, again the termite attack, and on with the pyramidical roof out of clay tile. Um, so I thought it's very interesting because it's a multi-purpose uh, building. So they have used this as a gathering or a eating. Sometimes they sleep on that ledge. So this is a recent photograph that is with the uh, umbrella by the side of the paddy field, and people are still using it. And this is another beautiful example of a monastery steps that I thought of very interesting because the journey uh, is very important in architecture. This Mintale, where the Buddhism has introduced to Sri Lanka. Uh, it's in fifth century, it's a monastery complex. It's a Kaludia Pokuna that I showed initially was a part of this. Um, so this, I really enjoy or like this uh, steps, wide steps, very narrow, very comfortable with the beautiful 
panjapani trees and give the shades to the uh, the steps so i thought it's maybe appropriate to show uh, to give you a little bit of an idea about uh, example so um, this project is uh, where this is my office and studio um, we start building this in 2012 um, and we complete in um, 2015 so uh, this is in Rajagiriya close to Colombo you can see uh, it's almost a part of the Colombo but it's not a city limit um, we found a land next to a marsh uh, it's very small footprint so that's the surrounding the context you can understand but you can see the green uh, and the water uh, within the city. So this is uh, Colombo or the Rajagiri town uh, condition at the moment. And this was uh, the site photograph taken, initial photograph. And you can see there's nothing interesting, but you can see the marsh or the reserve kind of a thing. It has a very big biodiversity and uh, wildlife. Uh, you get uh, porcupines and birds. Um, it's very nice uh, environment. So this is a, a photograph of, from the rooftop that I have taken. Um, so it's beautiful nature. Uh, so what we want to uh, do is trying to capture this view and uh, trying to enjoy this marsh, how we can do it by framing it. Um, uh, but understanding the uh, water condition here, we wanted to um, the, you know, safeguard the building because uh, occasionally we have noticed that water has rise above the ground level. So we can't build anything on the ground. And again, we can't lift the footing or the ground to safeguard our building. So what we were trying to do is, we were trying to use, design the office as well as the residence. So it's very simple, we want to lift the building. So then you just leave all the services at the ground level. So it makes us to safeguard our uh, important uh, office stuff. So basically, we leave the ground floor, any ground water flood situation, it can overflow through our uh, parking lot. So that's the idea. So uh, then we want to open to the marsh, that's obvious. We were trying to study the path, sun path, then it's because in the afternoon we have very humid, hot sun. After 1.30, you have to control the sunlight. So you can't open that. Uh, to the west. So we immediately we're trying to understand to create a buffer to the west sun. Uh, then again, it create a buffer to the, uh, the noise of the surrounding. So it helps us. Then again, we want to give a little bit of a punches that you can bring the uh, air movement to the building. At the same time, we can prevent the heat coming into. So that's the study that we have trying to work when we were making the concept. So it's a very simple idea in a very small footprint. So if you take the size of the land, it's about 40 by 80 feet. So our building is only 40 by 40. Uh, so we built only ways to the edge of the uh, thing, uh, the boundary. So this is a, some section that we were working with the uh, air gaps and then the inner wall that with the glasses and then the air movement through the pond to make it more cooler environment within that. So this is exact some of the sketches we were working with, uh, initial sketch that we were trying to get the maximum view from the, with the angular walls to the, of the marsh. And um, you can see the final layout of the uh, parking. And then the journey start with the wide steps. So you can see the uh, first floor is my office, our studio, and then this is uh, our residence but again there's no any private only the room we were trying to separate from the rest of the areas with the double height space we're trying to get more uh, connected spaces that we can have a multi-purpose functional space at this level and uh, when it comes to the rooftop level we totally want to detach from the rest of the areas to have uh, more relax or entertain the guests at this level so that's the detail section very simple and, um, and we're trying to use the material that supports the structure, basically. And uh, you can see some of the construction photos uh, before that brick wall. So I can, I'll show you that. So this is a, 
uh, envelope or a brick structure that we're trying to insulate the building because since that is having a concrete structure, we want to make it more thermal condition. So what we are trying to do is, we were trying to have an air gap between the inner wall and the outer wall that helps us to take the, all the surfaces through the building. At the same time, there's no conduction or the heat won't transfer from the brick wall to the inner wall. So that makes a more thermal condition or a micro cooler climate within the inner space. At the same time, we were trying to make the beauty by framing the view by very simple uh, opening where the parking, and uh, you can see the same material that we were trying to reclaim and uh, pave the stone at the parking area. And, uh, and then you start journey from that lower part to the upper level with the grand wider steps with the stones and um, the journey leads again like going to a temple. And uh, we're trying to change the material uh, subtly. Um, you can see the, the order from the ground level to here. There's a dif different material, different scale of pavers, and then smooth surface. And we were trying to work with a different volume here. You enter to a very smaller volume, then this is the entrance to the uh, space, inner space, and you open out with a bigger volume. That's where I want to make it the pause or the stop. This is where the clients come and stay. So I want to change the mindset. When they're walking through the wide steps, they'll come here and they all connect with the surrounding. And that's what I want to do it with the, um, you know, how we can change the mindset and uh, inner space is uh, again air conditioned room that I want to have it um, for the computers to work and this is my studio. And um, we use the, uh, the concrete surface as a very um, rough surface that controls the glare and it helps to make it a very cool and uh, soothing to your eyes and it's not to reflect the monitors. So it's very good condition to work and focus the computer or the work design. Um, but still at the same time, you can enjoy the nature from here. And this is a view from the top level, from the uh, upper level, but still we have a connection to the downstairs. And that's where what you can see, the, the, the brick. Uh, it creates a dramatic light condition to the inner space. Uh, casting shadows afternoon sun. And again, we have uh, vertical lures to control the, the, the rain. Uh, so that air gap, you can see the pond at the lower level. So the, uh, the cooler air movement starts coming from that line. And when you open the bigger openings there, and when you have a smaller, then the air start moving very fast and rapid. So it gives you proper air movement through the building. And uh, we change the lures vertically, so it seamless. Uh, the lures gives you a, uh, it's almost like fixed glass when it's closed, but again, if you want to get air movement, so you can open out. So those are some of the small details that we were trying to work with the um, available material there. And trying to get uh, indirect light to the interior. And that's again the bedroom that is framing the marsh in a different proportion, in a different uh, location. And the courtyards we were trying to, the, the, the toilet we were trying to create a, the void to get the ventilation and it gives you very much cross ventilation through the uh, building. And these are some of the elements that we've used to decorate the building. Um, some sculptor gave me out of tire that birds, I want to have something move, mo mobile uh, be there with the very light and safe. And he gave me with the tire rubber sculptures. So and the journey ends with the rooftop where I can have the pavilion and have a cross ventilation and totally detached from the ground floor function, the studio. When you're here, it's totally not feel like you are at the uh, studio or the workspace. 
and uh, we want to connect the landscape with the wide opening. And uh, this is some of the recent photograph that landscape has taken over and is almost like a part of the outside landscape, but still it's a rooftop garden um, with the grasses, wild grasses. Most of the grasses it start growing itself uh, there, less maintenance. Um, so this is actually another uh, project I thought of uh, to show as a part of the series, uh, how we can work with the very small footprint. And uh, this is in a very, quite a old foot, uh, project. Um, so this is a part of the bigger complex in three acres by the side of the Calendar River. So this is exist like a uh, old rubber estate. So there was a factory building and the office, and then they were asked me to do a, a residence for the engineer or the guests who are coming from the Colombo. So we select the lowest part where the marsh or the, the water collection happens. So we want to improve this, uh, the landscape to make it like a lake. So the plan is very simple to provide uh, him a shelter or a room uh, by having a, like a two parallel walls where I can have a, like a cruciform by can't leave a box on top of the rubble wall. So that is the initial idea, but then again, we add uh, elements like pool and the pantry, the courtyards, toilets, those are part of the, uh, the program. And again, we add uh, attic to give more additional space for the uh, more guests to come to sleep. So that's very small footprint uh, and trying to enjoy the landscape and uh, minimum impact to the ground, and, um, but still you can enjoy the landscape. So this was the initial photographs. Uh, so I want a building to be almost like a part of the landscape, vertical lines with the rubber trees and the black lines. Um, so the material, we want to make it more like a very light that is floating above the, build, uh, the ground only solid structure is two parallel rubble walls. The rest is almost like a thin material and more transparent building. And uh, it's, I want to make a connection to the water and get maximum uh, extension towards the water that you can enjoy the surrounding. And that's the entrance. Totally we left the ground floor open and um, you can, uh, it's almost like a pavilion and at the garden. This is in a monsoon day that we have taken the photographs. It's uh, very beautiful to see how the rain, you can enjoy the water from here. So from the attic that you can get the views of the uh, tank or a pond uh, through the uh, space of the bedroom area. So these are some of the courtyards for the toilets to get ventilation. And the ground level bedroom just have one room at the ground level. So this is actually the, my last project that I'm trying to share. This is a very interesting project because uh, this is for a jazz drummer and he's a ethno musician, Sri Lankan based uh, uh, jazz drummer. He, he actually, one of my friend, we have designed a house for him before this project. Uh, they had this property, it's like a quite a big abandoned project, like a land. Uh, it's in Goal, uh, down south, 100 kilometers away from Colombo. Uh, it's a, almost like a beautiful uh, level grassland surrounded with the creek. And um, what happened was with the, during the uh, heavy fall in the rainforest, uh, so it's water rise up again up to uh, four feet, uh, what they have recorded. And um, it's uh, expensive to build something on this ground, which is very muddy and again, uh, very uh, uh, almost like a, 
uh, grass, but with the water. So the uh, client gave me idea, say that he wants to reconnect with the uh, old uh, the village where he's grown up, and he want to renew the connection to the land. Uh, it was abandoned for a long time. So uh, we were trying to understand, and again, the sensitivity of the land. Uh, it's beautiful land. I don't want to make any permanent building. So we had thought of make it very transparent or a very impermanent building. Uh, so then again, we thought of why not we can use a scaffolding um, just to overcome this flood situation. So if you notice this flood line and the scaffolding line, it's almost above the flood line. So uh, the scaffolding that we normally use for the structures for uh, construction is a four and a half feet. So we just used that as a module to design this project. And uh, we just thought of keeping the three layers of scaffolding and put a platform so you are safe and that's you, what you want to do. So then we need to have a shelter. It's very simple to have a lean to roof above the steel structure and then enclose the rooms to give a, a room like spaces uh, by out of uh, the timber frames and then again very light material like plaster boards. Uh, the foam, actually the building consists of two bedrooms and the live-in. So we thought of having more veranda space rather than a inner space. So it's almost 50-50 uh, the space. So this is the layout. Even the twist that we want to have it, uh, from the side we derive that angle to save these sun path and again trying to frame a different views and uh, we twist the building and uh, we, we almost use the most construction material like a scaffolding platform as a pathways, some grills that we use for the reinforcement as a grill. So basically it's all used as a very economical or a low budget house, but still you can enjoy the nature. Um, so doing less is a good example with this project. So these are some of the details. And you can see in a rainy day how the building looks. And uh, this is taken by the El Croquis and thanks to Fernando. Uh, beautiful photo. Um, and you can see the, uh, the platforms take you to the upper level and still the water is there. And that height is enough to maintain the underneath the building. And we don't want to disturb the lifestyle of the existing uh, area. So the people who can have their cattle and graze them around that, and they can go through the building. So building act like a bridge. This is a veranda part of the living, so there's no inside outside uh, uh, disturbance. So you can see even the material or uh, the pantries, material, the, the furniture, we were trying to use the same available material. You can see the timber boards that we use for the flooring has been used for the pantry on a steel structure. So basically, we'll work with the available material to save money. Uh, to support the client and to complete the project within the budget. And that's the client with the daughter enjoying the weekend. Um, we have a small video of this, I think, uh, And uh... <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Palinda. We have now the possibility to make some questions if you want to make one. Si queréis hacer preguntas ahora es el momento. Buenas tardes. Bueno, yo creo que estamos todos muy tranquilos, no relajados con estas imágenes tan preciosas y toda esta arquitectura. ¿no? Primero, querría agradecer otra vez más ¿no? pues tu presencia aquí. Eh, yo creo que es una conferencia súper adecuada. Mi sentimiento es de que es muy adecuado para el taller que estamos haciendo. Eh, bueno, agradeceros esta arquitectura, yo diría, me atrevería a decir, tan humana, ¿no? que yo siento que precisamente eh, vosotros mismos, ¿no? tanto tú como Barna, eh, desprendéis ¿no? esta, esta humanidad, esta tranquilidad. ¿no? Y yo creo que esto es de, de agradecer eh, muchísimo en... En unos momentos, yo diría, confusos y que vivimos en, una gran, en un gran cambio y una gran complejidad. Entonces, quizá la, la, la reflexión que me, que me sugiere más, digamos, todo esto, ¿no? es decir, bueno, en este momento en que tantos arquitectos pues, nos peleamos bueno, por, por cosas arriesgadas, otros por formas exuberantes, otros por, por, por partes, digamos, o decir de que, que son arquitecturas sostenibles, otros arquitecturas más sociales. ¿no? La verdad es que esta arquitectura me hace pensar otra vez que la arquitectura al final no, no es adjetivable, no se trata de ninguno de estos adjetivos, sino que realmente la arquitectura es la capacidad de, de ejercitar la complejidad y sintetizarla, ¿no? saber sintetizarla como algo evidentemente para las personas. Y yo creo que vuestro trabajo, eh, verdaderamente en, en, en una región muy alejada de nosotros, con unas características muy, espe muy especiales, vosotros estáis intentando trabajar esta síntesis, ¿no? desde el cuidado, digamos, de cómo os, pues, os depositáis en el lugar, eh, todo el valor climático, ¿no? todas las formas respecto a este lugar. Es decir, intentáis mm, trabajar en esta síntesis. Yo creo que, que esto, pues para el taller y para todos nosotros, y sobre todo especialmente, yo creo, para la gente que está empezando, yo creo que esta arquitectura es ejemplar. Yo creo que incluso diría que es como un punto de referencia, una arquitectura que sabe situarse en, con bajos presupuestos, ¿no? con, depende, digamos, esta capacidad global que decía. ¿no? A mí la verdad es que me ha gustado muchísimo y, y, bueno, y deseando ver cómo realmente continuáis y qué evolución uh, tendréis a partir de, de estos primeros 20 años, ¿no? O sea que muchas felicidades. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bé, jo us felicito per la sensació que tinc d'arquitectura vinculada a l'espiritualitat, 
a la natura i a les persones. És com un cercle que es tanca i que fa l'efecte de ser molt feliç. M'agrada molt personalment, tot i que és molt allunyat de mi. Llavors, hi ha dues preguntes que potser són lletges o pragmàtiques. Una seria, què passa amb els mosquits? Perquè per mi aigua vol dir mosquits, vol dir insectes. Com es conviu amb aquests veïns? I dos, són estructures molt obertes i no entenc com és Sri Lanka al respecte a la propietat privada. És a dir, tanta obertura a mi em fa la sensació que en algun moment algú entrarà cap allà dintre. I a mi, d'aquí, em posa una mica nerviosa, aquests dos temes. Gràcies. Ok. The mosquito thing, I believe, when you have more openness and the ventilation cross through the space, they may not be able to stay in one place, so they can't breed or grow in the space. If you have corners or a curtain that you can have a dark areas that they always suck into that space. So, and uh, apart from that, I always keep the, uh, for example, house, uh, ground floor to be open with the cross ventilation, but then again, the rooms are more secured and you can lock it and there's more uh, windows to shut. So in that way, I'm trying to give uh, uh, options. So you live with the open environment and as well as you can control your environment with the secured space. So um, the robbery or a thief entering. So I think by looking at outside, those are not look like a very rich houses. So it's almost like a, you know, like a, some wall that is abandoned. So, and again, those are very high. I feel uh, when you have uh, open areas and you can't have any hidden corners again for them. Um, and uh, so far, I think touch wood, there was no incidents, and the people are like to keep it open. And uh, we respect, you know, in a village setup is they known to each other. It's still, you can leave the house open and go, and still that connection with the uh, neighbors are very strong in this uh, context. Uh, urban setup, we may not be able to do the same, but uh, for example, few houses that are shown is are all lockable from these, and again has a boundary wall about 20 feet with the perforated. So it's good enough to safeguard the uh, houses. And then again, there was nothing that valuables there, we just keep it. It's a maybe a few furniture or some elements. So they might not worth to take it. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you for your lecture. I think it I, well, I, I knew your work before because, uh, well, I'm an architect <laughs> and you're a very good architect, but uh, well, we are now doing this workshop with uh, RCR and we are like kind of learning uh, the method they use and it's very focused on the landscape, the place, uh, the program and the concept. <laughs> And it's like a line that uh, we, we are trying to learn and to follow to create uh, an architecture that is more, uh, makes like currents with the, the landscape. And with your work that you show, uh, it seems to me that uh, apart from the landscape, the importance you give to, the, to this is the people, like the people that is gonna live there. And you talk uh, a lot about uh, where they come from, what do they do, uh, why they are asking you for this, the reality of them, you know? And I would like to know how is your process to, to learn that? Because usually, uh, like a client that comes to you, that wants to a house or whatever they want, uh, they just uh, tell you like what they want 
like I want a bedroom, a bath, <laughs> and there is a lot of more in there. Um, I don't know, I, I would like to, if you can share how is your process to, to, to know what the reality of the people you are building architecture for Yeah, is. I think, uh, yes, um, we are only working with very selected projects because we, as a firm we want to closely work with the client and the site and um, we have very small resources and the small things. But uh, we don't say no to the project, but we want to learn, uh, study about the client. We take some time. We are not rushing to the design immediately. Um, and we always like to have a clients who have uh, seen or enjoy our work rather than just shopping or uh, coming to an unknown, uh, saying that if you are an architect, are you doing architecture kind of thing. So we really appreciate that people who have seen or appreciate our architecture because it's very easy to communicate, to understand and give something back that is we also can be uh, satisfied. So um, we normally take project with understanding their background and their budget and they, that they can understand to live within kind of a concept. So we always have freedom for them also. There's no forcefully doing architecture. So we'll explain very uh, carefully. And there's a process that even sometimes clients can't understand architecture initially, but um, with their background, we can understand that with, at least we can communicate to for the same goal. Uh, so we work within a quite a long period with the clients because the uh, houses, we don't keep uh, like a initial and design and then work in drawings. We always develop with the client requirement very closely with the site. So it takes some time. So even they learn during that time, how to live, how to, uh, you know, adjust to that kind of a thing. So we always has a duty uh, to give that knowledge or a transfer it. But there's a limit that we can do. Uh, that's why I said that if the people with the background of understanding and enjoy the architecture, those are the clients I'm really welcome. And But still, we have no, you know, rejections in a way. Uh, but we'll take some time. We'll take and have a dialogue, meetings, and a uh, lot of discussion before we undertake. Uh, for them also, there's a chance of finding the correct architect. So we have to have that flexibility because uh, we may be with not the right architect for some our clients. So we have to give them that freedom, flexibility to withdraw or uh, walk away. So I think that's a duty as an architect. Uh, we won't take the project that they, if they can't understand or enjoy our architecture, so that is very important for us. But at the same time, we can't cater to the everyone. So there's a always filter and uh, yeah. Hey, good night. Thank you very much for your lecture. I really liked it because, you know, I felt like home a bit because I'm from Colombia. And, you know, the, the greens that you seen, I see, I saw, like, in the pictures are very difficult to find in other places, you know, and kind of Colombia and Sri Lanka are the same distance from the equator line. So I really enjoyed the, the lecture, and I would like to ask, uh, for me, it was really beautiful because all the projects you showed are inside of Sri Lanka, but in an hypothetical case, if you seek to go worldwide, how would be your approach to an international project? How to, you know, keep the, the, the feelings that you transmit by your architecture? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so it's a good question. Initially, we were trying to focus in a way that known context, because the context is very, under, very important. Uh, because it has to be catered or relate to the place. Uh, architecture always want to try to be a part of the context and belongs to that place, not to be an alien. Uh, so we were very comfortable with doing in Sri Lanka, but uh, we have done a few projects overseas as well. Um, but we were learning that process, how we can communicate and to understand their culture and the values and material. So at the moment, we are doing uh, three projects in India. So that is expanding our practice to neighbor uh, island, uh, country. 
So that makes us more easier to understand the culture uh, and it's known from a long time. Um, so I think that's how we're trying to expand. But projects, we always open, we like to get more opportunities, but still carefully we want to take uh, and uh, gain, uh, take some time, we'll take a little bit of studying uh, to, because it's very important to understand uh, where your buildings are locating and how we can respond to the people and their behaviors and their lifestyle, way of living. Those are the things we always try to understand to make it unique buildings. Um, so I think, uh, yes, we are trying to do overseas at the moment and uh, it uh, helps us to understand global vision and again language of architecture because we don't want to only focus in Sri Lanka because that is very comfortable. Now we have doing 15, 17 years practice there, so it's time again to learn more different cultures, so we started. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, during your presentation, we, uh, we really felt that you care about the uses of the materials. And we saw that um, you really care about like, the, the orders of the material that you choose. When we saw that with stone, with terracotta, and, uh, and, um, and steel too, and wood. So I wanted to know what is your process with it, especially when you're able to use this much materials. Um, even if we saw a lot of them with bricks and that you were able to play with it, to know how to use it. So I wanted to know your process with it and especially maybe with models or stuff like that. So Thank the you. material, I think uh, we are trying to work with the available material because as I said, the budget is very critical in Sri Lankan uh, architecture, construction. So we can't uh, design something not available. So brick, stones, steel, and uh, wood are the material that is always it's available. Even if it comes to wood, we always trying to use reclaimed wood. So it's from the old uh, houses that they have removed the roof, and then we'll try to slice it to windows and floorboards and et cetera. So we like to reuse because it gives a texture, color, uh, and uh, quality to the space. So uh, when you are trying to start with the concept, so the material is always uh, refined with the concept. We want to get the material to support the building and the, or the final vision of the project. So it's not arbitrary. We are just using whatever we like. So every project we were trying to use, even though it's available material, we want to use the colors or the sections and uh, maybe uh, stones to enhance the final concept or uh, to support the initial concept. So in that way, when we start designing, we'll have a, a visual uh, understanding about the, how the building looks, and then it develop with the selection of material. So we'll remove the unwanted things always. It's almost process of detach, you know, like we don't want, we remove the things more than adding things. So we finally collect the material that we really want to use it only. So then it's very simple. So the palette is always, uh, you know, based on the concept. So there's no any additional thing, or oh, what is it, this is available, we should use that, nothing like that. So if it is like checkerboard, yes, checkerboard, because it's a lighter, so we need to have a deck, and then it's a strong to, without any support, so it's obvious to have a checkerboard. Or the, so likewise, so always a base on the need of the concept or the project, then we select the material. Um, smooth surfaces against the rough surfaces, so what is available for roughness and what is the smooth and the titanium flows, whether the titanium, whether we are using the darker or the black or the lighter gray, the shades of gray. So th those are the things that we always want to material. So if the walls are lighter, then the surface has to be darker. So it's very simple theory. So architecture always comes with some sort of idea, logic. So we just used our experience to enhance the space. So that's very easy. When you work with that, then you know exactly what you want to use it. So then only you finding the available material there, it's then you don't have a hundred things to select. So simplifying your uh, complexity is make your life 
easier, practice easier, then you can focus with more things than only searching for elements. We always select very few light fittings or the sanitary fittings or taps or something. We don't want to hunt for that. So we are not a firm that you want to get the latest fittings, latest switches or some. It's very, whatever is comfortable, we have been using for maybe 10 years. So that's easy. Well, thank you, thank uh, Palinda, for uh, sure. answering all our questions. So with, I think we can now stop, stop for today <laughs> and uh, continue speaking uh, on private level with each other on these uh, projects. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.